All right. I'll let everybody get seated. Can you hear me okay? You got a thumbs up? All right. Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Steven Swain. I'm a, a sales engineer with Corelight. Uh, how many of you have heard of Corelight before? All right. How many of you heard of Zeke? Bro? Ah, uh, yes. It's always, it's always kind of the bro community. So um, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, kind of what, what I've seen in terms of being a practitioner for over 20 years, the gaps I've seen from an EDR perspective, and really kind of what, what Gartner talks about, the SOC visibility triad. So, um, so Corelight integrates with your existing security ecosystem and transforms network traffic or packets from the network or a cloud into actionable evidence. So I think for, for me, uh, I've always kind of had this notion of, you know, there's a better way to log. Um, it, has anybody taken Justin Henderson's SEC 555 class? Excellent. So things that you learn in there, that there's an agent versus agent based, uh, agent list or agent based logging. And I think that's a really important concept that we'll talk about. Um, so no matter what changes in security, I think Corelight gives you the one advantage, which is that evidence, uh, regardless of signatures or fancy M M ML or AI. So let's jump in. All right. So looking at uh, quick agenda, uh, there's a lot of classes actually within SANS already that teach a lot of the Zeke kind of uh, the mindset and using those tools. So how many of you have taken ICS 456? Anybody? SEC 301? Kind of the intro to okay good how about uh the ids track that mike poor did so long ago uh that i took i think back in 2006 503 intrusion detection and depth okay one of my one of my favorites of course just being a network nerd um there's also sec 450 blue team fundamentals uh sec 511 which i think is a pretty great course uh and then i already mentioned justin's so who am i um just real quick, I, I had uh, been in the business for about 20 years, uh, multiple industries, both in the military and private sector, um, in and out of uniform. I've gotten to serve with some of the best and brightest people um, that we have to offer. Um, so my prior MOS, the Marine Corps, was a, a second Marine, uh, what we like to say, control alt kill, sir. So not the, not the shoot shoot Marine, but the control alt kill. Um, after that, I actually transitioned over to the Navy Reserves as a cryptologic warfare officer, and I've been doing that for about 15 years and, and loving it. So um, I think some of my, my most exciting opportunities, though, is I actually had a chance to um, be a part of the 92nd IOS, which is actually the, uh, what I say is the Air Force's original blue team um, 10, 15 years ago, um, and then most recently at Navy Cyber Defense Operations Command, which was a phenomenal experience. Um, I got to uh, help lead uh, nine Navy cyber protection teams. So um, in 2000, 2006, 2016, I actually kind of branched out of DOD contracting and I wanted to kind of cut my teeth in the civilian sector. Uh, so I started working for a large financial firm and actually led a threat analytics team. So our job was basically to build content. Um, we did a sim migration like many of you have done before uh, or are doing. Um, and I think I think what I what I realized is there's a much better way to do this, right? Not just to migrate your sim, but to get more timely data into your sim into that third piece of what Gartner calls the SOC visibility triad. Um, so really, kind of building those detections and use cases for our SOC uh, was always a lot of fun, and kind of coming up with, you know, I, th I think you guys all went through the Log4j um, kind of um, debacle. Um, but ultimately, I just figured out there was a better way uh, to get that metadata and to take those correlated alerts with uh, Suricata or RDS and, and just find a better way. Uh, huge SANS fan. I think uh, you can look up my analyst ID, but uh, I've been kind of participating in SANS and kind of attending different trainings uh, since the early 2000s, actually back when Ed Skoda still had hair. Um, so, uh, I still remember taking one of his first 504 classes. So, uh, great guy. Love Ed. All right. So who are we kind of just as a company? Um, I'll, I'll try to kind of get into the nitty gritty. So I'll move through this quickly. Um, but we're an open network detection and response platform. Um, again, what Gartner calls the SOC visibility triad, where that third leg with the SIM and the EDR portion, um, we call it open because it's built on open source technologies backed by over 20 years of uh, elite defenders and, and experience. Um, 
Corlett Labs, um, our research team actually is still led by Dr. Vern Paxson, who originally is the one who came up with Bro. Um, so shout out to him and thank you again, because we wouldn't be here. Um, enterprise class, um, because I think it's, it's actually deployed in some of the largest Fortune 500 companies in the world, um, multiple governments and agencies and, and communities like that. Um, we've, we've been kind of on this journey with Bro to Zeek to Corelight commercialization. We actually shipped our first sensor in 2017. Um, but I love the fact that the founders and, and the maintainers of Zeek are actually still with the company today. So if you look at uh, our GitHub, uh, the Zeek GitHub Merge Master page, every single person who can commit code uh, to the Zeek project happens to be employed by Corelight. So you can kind of think of those things synonymously. But it actually lets, lets us kind of take uh, the best parts of the open source community and integrate that into a commercial product. Um, one of the things that I like to preach is that, you know, in in life we're told, you know, it's it's about it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. But I think the reason why Corelight a lot of times is because it's less about the it's less about the journey and get to the destinations as quickly as possible, right? From an incident response perspective. Um, so you don't you don't have time to worry about you know is that is that node up is that Zeek worker working are you troubleshooting it right so um, so we're at, we're actually also funded by uh, some of some really good VCs uh, notably CrowdStrike who we're actually going to talk about today um, because they recognized us as a leader in, in DR space all right and then headquartered in uh, San Francisco like many software based companies so but we have an office in Ohio as well. And then folks like me um, on the Fed team are actually remote as a, as a lot of you are now. All right. So if I get excited when I talk about our logs or our data or what we do, it's because I actually really love it. Um, my previous company, I was actually the core light champion that I brought it into and spent about two years deploying it. So. I'm, I'm not your traditional sales engineer. I'm more of a practitioner that became a sales engineer, uh, but I know what teams can do with this data and I know how many people uh, I've helped with this good data. So, um, but at the end of the day, I, our company is really founded on a set of core convictions about the transform, transformative power of network evidence. Um, adversaries cannot evade the network, right? It, most likely they can't. And endpoints can be evaded. Virtually all attacks must cross the network. And in doing so, the attackers create a trail of network evidence. And that's where the power of, of the Zeek metadata, our Suricata IDS alerts, and also a feature that we won't have time to dive, dive into today, but it's actually called Smart PCAP. So the network cannot lie. Um, so threat intel, your IOC feeds and detections can generate false positives. Um, you can actually miss real threats. Um, endpoints themselves can be exploited by APTs and rendered unreliable narrators. I think the network, however, cannot lie. So um, I've always been kind of throughout my career more network-based than I am host-based, um, but we'll talk about some of the, the advantages of both. So evidence definitely drives knowledge. Um, alerts are imperative, right, to your success for your teams, but at the end of the day, you can't rely on a vendor to solely provide you a set of signatures, what they think is bad, right? Because you all know your network better than any vendor will ever know them. So I think if you can, you can couple the evidence first or data first strategy along with something like uh, alert signatures, then you're kind of cooking with fire. Uh, knowledge fuels disruptive defense. So Again, when you understand your environment, you can act quickly and more readily to disrupt attacks and progress and respond and contain those that have already occurred. So disruptive really just means a proactive uh, threat hunting. Um, my former company, we actually we couldn't actually say hunt because it had negative connotations. So uh, we would actually call it proactive threat discovery. So kind of an internally coined term, which was funny. But um, a lot of people kind of in this space now say like, hey, what about encrypted traffic? Well. Uh, how many of you have heard of JA3 fingerprinting from Salesforce? Okay, JA3, JA3. All right, wonderful stuff. Um, so even even though that session is encrypted, so let's say that 80% of your your network traffic is encrypted, when those sessions get set up and that that handshake occurs, you can still get the metadata from the certificate information, right? So who is it signed by? Uh, when does it expire? Uh, attackers love to do things like 
um, make really long expiration dates where a typical commercial company might only do it for six months to a year, maybe 18 months on the certificate. Uh, so just easy things to look for. So there's a lot of value, even if you are primarily dealing with encrypted traffic that you can do insights. So um, we don't dive too much into the packages, but happy to set up a demo for anybody in the room uh, after this class or after the webinar, um, or just hit me up on email um, and we'll, we'll get you taken care of. So I love this slide because uh, I think it kind of it kind of summarizes everything. Uh, I'll see if this thing tracks with me for a second. All right. So raise your hand if you have a sim. All right. Raise your hand if you have an EDR. Okay. So you have two. Uh, how many of you have an NDR solution in place right now? Okay. So that's why you, you'll see in the presentation why I actually go from pivoting from an existing EDR solution like a carbon black. CrowdStrike, MDE, et cetera, or Tanium, and then pivoting over to an NDR solution. Because I think a lot of people, like we just saw a show of hands, um, most people have that EDR solution in place. So what we do is we actually will we'll accept traffic. So you can deploy our sensors in just about any, any environment. We go where your data goes. So uh, anywhere that, where there's traffic, we will be there. Um, kind of our core capabilities that I started to highlight, again, kind of that open NDR concept, we have the IDS piece with Suricata. Any Suricata fans? Snort fans? No? Okay. Um, uh, Richard Baitlish, uh, who is actually uh, part of our company as well. Anybody heard of him? The Tau of Network Security Monitoring. He's written a lot of really good material. Um, again, kind of that Air Force background. I had the ability to um, kind of cut my teeth kind of based on his teachings. So happy to work with him today at Corelight as well. Uh, packet capture, anybody have a packet capture solution in place? How expensive is it? How many, what, what's your retention time? Six months, that's really good. Okay, how about you, sir? Five years? Okay, well, with Corelight Smart Packet Capture, we can actually 10x your, your, your existing packet capture capability. And the reason is, is because I think a lot of people uh, we, we can go, we can talk offline about that, but I think that the biggest thing is don't capture the encrypted packets that you're never going to be able to decrypt, but also how we approach it is we use, uh, why we call it smart PCAP, is we can set levers that will actually say like this protocol or this subnet or a Zeek, for example, can't understand the protocol or you're using a different protocol, it can automatically capture those packets and then save it off to your storage device. Um, again, we take all those kind of three core capabilities and we feed it into your favorite SIM. Um, so most of them are up here, the big players, but uh, a lot of our customers do use Splunk. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that we actually map to either the Elastic Common, uh, common Schema or we map to uh, Splunk's Common Information Model for those of you who kind of want to leverage those accelerated data models. All right. So like I said, Corelight goes wherever your traffic goes. Um, I think, you know, if you if you have a data center, uh, if you have a cloud instance, most of us are on that cloud journey already um, or kind of a hybrid environment, we have you covered. Um, so our software sensor can actually uh, be deployed into those difficult situations. So the biggest thing is that you wanna feed our sensor with your packet broker, tap or span. Um, obviously in that order of preference, because uh, as I found out early in my career, spans can drop traffic. Uh, they can compete for resources on that switch. So not, it's not always gonna get replicated and then you have gaps, so. So we also have the ability to incorporate threat intel feeds. So if you had kind of your favorite IOCs or maybe there's a campaign or a threat actor that you're tracking, we can actually embed those on our sensor. And why I think that's important is because, you know, where, where your EDR solution can have a, a current list of IOCs, sometimes there's gonna be devices or hosts on your network that don't support that agent. And you have to be able to look at the network level to kind of, uh, to see that. We also have the ability to enrich uh, with CMDB information. Um, so adding asset and, asset and in inventory information, which I think is pretty powerful. And again, uh, we don't, I don't have a slide on it today, but we have the ability to do fork and filter. So like I said, in my previous company, we, we were able to use Corelight data to support multiple teams. So I had 
the NetOps team that could use it for more troubleshooting purposes, uh, just to see if traffic was flowing, right? Uh, we also tackled um, uh, DNS logging, so actually being able to get the request and the response with your DNS data, which is great for a defender. Um, I also liked uh, um, the crypto team. So our PKI team actually had the ability to look at the certificates in use, which I think was pretty powerful um, independently. And again, passive network security monitoring, being able to kind of just step back. We're not in line. We're never going to, we're never going to modify the traffic or, or impact your network. So we have the ability to kind of sit out of band and just receive a copy of it. Um, we can pipe it, uh, pipe our data and our logs to um, uh, your favorite file analysis tools. So we actually have the ability to extract files off the wire. And then obviously I kind of talked about uh, smart PCAP having the ability to carve off those packets. Uh, one of the things that I think still holds true today is actually Rob Joyce's comments. And he was the head of the NSA TAO uh, around 2016 at Usenix. He said his worst nightmare as kind of a offensive based, um, I guess, professional um, was really out of band network security monitoring. So having the ability to, to sit passively on the network they don't even know you're there and just to take a copy of the traffic and generate metadata is a pretty powerful concept kind of like an invisible security guard if you want to think of it that way all right so diving into really kind of uh i think that the focus of today is that most edr deployments will never be 100 percent. i will bet somebody in here free lunch right now if you can tell me that your entire network has 100 percent edr agent coverage and you have to have at least 10,000 endpoints any takers? Okay. I'm not monitoring chat, but if there's somebody on chat, I will also send you a, a DoorDash gift card uh, if need be. But um, so I think I think we can all agree that no matter what, uh, you're not going to be able to deploy an EDR agent to every single endpoint. So that's where you have to supplement it with what Gartner calls that SOC visibility triad, right? You have to have the ability to look outside and say, you know what? I know my, my endpoint deployment is at 85% and I have, you know, 150,000 nodes, but I know there's legacy applications, uh, legacy devices that just can't support it, right, from a memory or CPU uh, perspective. So maybe, maybe you just can't deploy. Uh, the business also drives where you can deploy this sometimes too. So I know that was a challenge uh, for me in the past. Um, printers. BYOD, if you're a large educational uh, institution and you don't actually own the endpoints, right? The students are just bringing their personal laptops. How do you, how do you monitor that? So um, I will say, I think they, they've made a lot of really good changes or, or advancements in IoT uh, space. So I think, how many of you saw the, the announcement with uh, Microsoft embedding Zeek into Windows? Anybody see that? Pretty amazing. I think that just kind of solidifies our technology of, of how you want to use it. Um, we can talk more offline about the, the details on that though. So um, actually this class right now, the cloud forensics class 5, 509, the room you're in right now, um, I happen to have uh, the book. So it just happens to be in my backpack. So they let me sit in here, but I actually took the cloud forensics. And I think that the biggest takeaway for me and for the few students from this class that are in there uh, in here uh, is you can't trust your cloud providers to give you all the data, right? And even when you can, there's certain features that they're going to turn on and off. Um, so one of my big takeaways that I got out of that class was, you know, they're going to give you the best that they can from a logging perspective. But if you have the ability to use something like CoreLight, which is an independent, passive way to log, uh, to, to view the packets, within your cloud environment and create consistent logs, I think is, is pretty powerful. So that's something that I, I'm kind of pushing internally, what I call symmetric uh, logging capability. So if you have the ability to generate the same quality of data in various cloud environments and your on-prem networks, I think that that can really help your defenders because we have a lot of SOCs that get 15 different panes of glass. Um, and I think if you, if you can give them consistent data across all those providers, it can be really good. Um, so again, I think on, on the Docker note, I have a slide on the next one, just as an example of how we would, we would integrate with that, but attackers will also target your EDR tools, right? 
So something that has root level, kernel level access to your operating system is definitely going to be a, a, a nice uh, opportunity for an attacker. But also they can subvert them. They can take advantage of them. They can flood them with, with known uh, information. Uh, they can block them from downloading updates or signatures, things like that. So it's really about kind of the dis de detection aspects and deeper visibility is kind of how we help and supplement those gaps. All right, so just a quick uh, Kubernetes enrichment example. Um, so I, this is actually a, a Zeek JS plugin um, where we're using um, a Kubernetes API to get information on all the pods. And then we populate that into a Zeek uh, record table and then feed that back in. So I think if you can, you can see on the bottom, it's not so visible. I think, can everybody see it in the back? So what we're doing is we're actually appending the, uh, the AWS or the, sorry, the, the Kubernetes log information, pod information to our logs. Um, in this case, it's the con log or the connection log. So pretty powerful concept. We won't go too deep on, on Kubernetes and, and cloud monitoring, but I think, you know, again, we can schedule a separate session if you guys would like. But I think that the big takeaway for me is how do you monitor something? How do you deploy an EDR agent for uh, an instance that's only alive for five seconds or five minutes? Like, what do you do? Like it, it spins up, it spins down, it's gone. And it's, 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 it's forever uh, difficult to retrieve artifacts from. All right, so um, NDR wise, I think, you know, I think the big takeaway here is, is we give the breadth and, and EDR tools actually give the depth. Uh, again, they're not going to be perfect, uh, so you have to kind of supplement that SOC visibility triad with that. Um, all right, and just a quick kind of quick example of kind of what our logs will look like in Splunk. So those of you familiar with uh, Corelight logs or Zeek logs uh, and the metadata that we can we can create about a network connection, this is pretty powerful stuff. Um, so here we actually have a, um, a Suricata alert uh, based on an existing ET Pro. ET Pro created by Proofpoint, so emerging threats. Uh, a lot of our customers use their feeds, but from there we can actually pivot uh, via the unique ID. So this is actually the the special sauce between our integration with Suricata and Zeek, and we give the ability uh, for SOC analysts and, and threat hunters to actually pivot between the alert with the appropriate metadata. So a lot of us, and, and I found this challenging for multiple years of my career, trying to take trying to take all these correlated data sources uh, or all these disparate data sources in my SIM and correlate them to make sense, right? Time is always the major factor and challenge, uh, different time zones. Um, so I think having having data like this, any, any SOC analyst is lucky. Um, so pivoting from the, the unique ID, we can actually switch over to the con log. Um, and it's the, again, the connection log, and we can actually see the information about it and we can see the associated files and the hash of the file, and then we can then upload that to our favorite uh, reputation database or virus total for most people. All right, well, wait a minute. I told you that this wasn't just about NDR. So our logs are great by, the, by themselves, but let's pivot over. So any basketball fans in the room? Okay, all right. So um, I, I had to do this today because I think this this kind of shares a concept that I've always lived, you know, my my career by. But um, Tim Duncan is actually a five time NBA champion, uh, three time Finals MVP, and actually a two time regular season MVP. Uh, any takers in the room? What was his nickname? The Big Fundamental. You are correct, sir. See me after for a prize. Um, so I, I actually personally have a lot of heartburn with the San Antonio Spurs because I'm a diehard Phoenix Suns fan. And just by coincidence, uh, the Phoenix Suns are actually playing the San Antonio Spurs tonight. Uh, did not plan that. So just kind of, that was the schedule. Um, but it's hard to not acknowledge his greatness, right? Um, he, he is literally the, the kind of player that wasn't flashy. He wasn't throwing out, you know, um, uh, crazy, you know, crazy, uh, um, I guess, trash talking um, environments and things like that. But he, he really, he was known as the big fundamental because he did the basics very, very well. Um, and I think that's what led to his success. So I think as security professionals, that's what we have to focus on. Like, don't, don't let a vendor tell you about advanced, you know, machine learning algorithms that are going to protect you. 
or the one push button solution that's going to solve all your problems, right? You have to take an evidence first, data first strategy. You have to know what is before you can know what is bad. Um, and I think that's the same kind of, um, I guess, example that I would say Corelight is, is kind of like Tim Duncan, where we do the basics very, very well. And there's a place and a time for things like machine learning and AI always, right? But it has to have good data. And that's where we, that's where we come in. So we give good, consistent data. So I have another basketball analogy uh, that I'll throw it up at the end, but I hope everybody can kind of understand that, that, uh, that example. So uh, before we jump into the CrowdStrike piece, um, the two that I really wanted to showcase today are, are some of the partnerships that we've um, announced recently. Um, but I wanted to actually showcase um, Microsoft's uh, MDE and pivoting to Corelight data in Sentinel, uh, but our demo will be up and ready uh, to play with at RSA. So anybody going to RSA? Okay, you probably, you spent all your travel budget for the year, okay. Um, we're, we're definitely going to have a, uh, I, I hope, an online CTF as well, so you guys can log in and play with the data. Uh, eventually, I would love to have kind of a build your own kind of uh, use case where you can say, I have Carbon Black, and I have Splunk, and I want to try Corelight data in conjunction with that, but it would be pretty slick. So uh, just really, really good alliances with, with two of these big partners. Um, again, Microsoft is making really good advancements uh, towards the IoT space. All right, so um, here we go with kind of a quick example, uh, pivoting from EDR, EDR alert to NDR data. And the reason why I chose this example again is because a lot of you already have an EDR solution in place. So I want you to kind of look at it, what it would be from a micro view to a macro view, where a lot of us, when we get indicators um, or maybe TTPs that we want to hunt for, we'll actually go from a big kind of macro view down to a micro view when we find something. So. Um, I'll also kind of caveat this with um, this, this exercise was actually done with the, the concept of this is a, a, an IoT device or a, I think a VoIP phone in this case on your network where you cannot have an EDR agent. So not to point out any, any discrepancies with CrowdStrike's um, agent, um, but this is, in this case, it wasn't able to be deployed there. So just caveat that. So how many people are familiar with PowerShell Empire? Okay. All right. So that's what we're looking at here today. Uh, so this is kind of the typical anal analyst view uh, within CrowdStrike Falcon. And we pivot over. So um, they actually have a nice ability to, to kind of decode the PowerShell as well, um, which is great. Or you can use something like CyberChef. Um, but kind of transitioning over to uh, FDR. So a lot of uh, CrowdStrike customers will have about a 30-day retention time. Um, and then they'll actually transition that data to a long-term storage, uh, what they call FDR. So Falcon Data Replicator, now we're gonna transition over to more of a visualization. Um, and what you can see on the bottom, and note that this is actually in ascending order, so bottom first, and we wanna zoom in on the attacker methodology and drill in a little bit further. Uh, so we've detected a use of PowerShell, and then you can actually see the the, the transition up, we kept the username and the, the host name the same. So um, from WEF up to a DC, so they're doing kind of, they're, they're doing lateral movement in this attack, uh, but just a kind of a good use case. But again, seeing Corelight data in uh, a non, non Splunk, non Sentinel kind of environment was, was really exciting for us. So again, we, we just transitioned from a visual to a tabular view. Um, and then, so we're diving in and now we're looking at kind of getting more detail within FDR. And here we can see the, actually the, the context process ID in the FDR, uh, which we'll use to actually pivot to the community ID. And this is something that's like, I think has been missing for a long time is being able to pivot from, from host to network, network to host. I think a lot of times we have the ability to go from network to host pretty easily, but How are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. All right, so um, looking at the Network Connect IP4 V12 log, actually in, in, in FDR, we can establish the linkage actually from that context process ID to our community ID. Um, I, I threw this up here, any Always Sunny in Philadelphia fans? 
Okay. So my, my, my colleague, Tim actually loves this. And as soon as he saw this, you know, there's gotta be a connection, right? He kind of freaks out in the mail room uh, over this guy, Pepe Silva, but there's, there's always a linkage, right? Um, and again, I can kind of the importance of that is, is like we talked about, you, there's going to be places that you just can't see um, with your EDR. And that's again, the, the use case here where somebody plugged in a rogue device to a VoIP phone. All right, so we've gone from context process ID to community ID, and now we have the ability to pivot directly into our core light logs. So if you haven't seen our data, it's amazing. I get nerd chills every time I think about it. Uh, but just thinking about kind of the different protocols that you can see on the network and then cut a log for is, is truly, truly special. Um, so now we can have the complete connection protocol awareness with NDR data. And again, kind of what I show, showcased earlier, that UID or that unique identifier, now we can pivot between a Suricata alert to a connection log to a file that was downloaded uh, and extracted off the wire. So pretty powerful stuff. Um, so any guesses where you would pivot next? Any takers? All right. So uh, is it normal to see NTLM over TLS? Um, do you have any other devices that are reaching out to that C2? to so kind of think about like, these, these are the things that you would kind of go beyond or next steps. Um, look at the other alerts that are around around that same time frame from that endpoint uh, or anybody reaching out to that C2. Um, do we have patient zero? What was in that decoded PowerShell? Um, I hope, hopefully, I think I, I blurred it out or, or removed it, but I didn't want to actually uh, ruin Dustin Lee's, uh, he's a GSE, uh, works for our, our technical marketing team, but I didn't want to burn his, uh, his domain, his Xfil domain. So, uh, but again, this scenario, we, we had a rogue device in which the CrowdStrike agent wasn't able to be deployed. Um, and I think kind of the, the, the so what or the why do you care? Um, again, EDR deployments are rarely, rarely complete. Um, there's always going to be devices on your network that just can't support that agent. Um, and again, I didn't go from NDR to EDR because I wanted to kind of show what you guys already have and where you could go next. Um, but I think it, it also tells a good story of our better together. Um, what I, what I would say is like peanut butter and jelly, right? NDR and EDR are kind of like peanut butter and chocolate, peanut butter and jelly. Um, but again, going from that kind of large visibility breadth to a more narrow focus on the EDR side. Um, and how many of your, your threat hunters or incident responders don't need better puzzle pieces, right? I think that's, that's what we bring to the table as well. And then again, kind of back to the basics, the fundamentals, I think from a Tim, Tim Duncan perspective, the CIS controls, right? Asset and inventory. Like, do you have a good SA on everything on your network, everything that's supposed to be on your network? Um, oh, I have one more. And I think, I think ultimately, you know, this, this function right now that's in log scale um, is gonna be integrated by CrowdStrike shortly. Um, and they're just completing the resource utilization testing. So just to make sure it doesn't uh, cause too much process uh, intensive stuff. So, but I think overall, I mean, core light data and, and what we bring to the table is kind of like back to the basketball analogy where we're, we, are, we are a pass first point guard. We wanna make your SIM tool, your EDR tool uh, better. So we make everybody around us better think is, you know, if you want to throw out John Stockton or John Starks or Steve Nash uh, for the basketball fans in the room. And again, I'm an old school basketball fan and I've been a 30, 30 plus years Phoenix Suns fan. So um, we'll see what they do this year with Kevin Durant. So, um, all right. So I'll shut up now and, and please, uh, if there's any questions, I don't think anybody's monitoring chat. All right. Any questions? The first one's always the hardest. Don't be afraid. Okay. There. Uh, 
I, I won't touch on any specific vendor or, or kind of export option, um, but we have the ability to, to send data wherever you want. Um, it could be via HEC, it could be via Kafka, it could be JSON over TCP. Like, I mean, it, the possibilities are literally endless for us to export to a SIM or a, a data lake. Um, I think the biggest the biggest takeaway is is having quality and consistent data for those machine learning uh, opportunities. So, um, you, you if you don't have bad or curated data, your detections and, and that stuff are not they're just not going to work. Um, so, hope that answers your question. So, all right, next question. Don't be shy. Any San Antonio Spurs fans? No? Okay, good. All right. So um, I think we're at, got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'll stick around. Uh, feel free to, to, if you're shy, uh, come pull me on the side. Um, I have cards as well. If you want to talk more, I can set up a demo for you. Um, but I think hopefully the takeaway is that you have the ability now to pivot between EDR and NDR, NDR to EDR. Um, and I hope that really kind of showcased that as an example. So. All right, thank you. Let me kill it. Yeah. I'll take the card from you. Yeah, uh, please. I, I would like to see a demo later on. Absolutely, man. Uh, don't have time today. I don't know whether it's FedRAMP or not. I actually have to drive. 